Hello and welcome back to Catch and Cook California. I'm Kevin. If you don't know, I am a doctor of anthropology. Specifically, I'm an archeologist and more specifically, I study ancient technologies. And in this video, I wanna show you how our ancestors learned to manipulate rocks that they would find in a riverbed like this to detach flakes with razor sharp cutting edges and how these simple flakes changed everything. Now, when I first got into anthropology, the story that I learned was that the oldest stone tools on earth were called Oldowan tools, and that those were associated with Homo habilis, the so-called handyman. We now know that the oldest stone tools predate the Oldowan and predate Homo habilis, and these we refer to as the Lomaquian. The Lomaquian was originally discovered about 10 years ago along the eastern shores of Lake Turkana in Kenya. The Lomaquian dates to 3.3 million years ago. It's largely characterized by passive hammer where the core is struck against an anvil stone like this. In this case, removing a smaller flake, but certainly you can remove much larger flakes as well. And also by this technique, hammer and anvil. Here you can see a flake that I've removed through the latter method. The makers of Lomaquian could be Kenyanthropus platyops or potentially an Australopithecus. Sites like Dikika, which date to around the same time as the Lomaquian, have evidence for stone tool use but not stone tool production. So percussed and cracked open bones with what we refer to as green fractures, showing that they were broken when they were fresh and other bones that have distinct cut marks on them showing that meat was removed from those bones using stone tools. But the vast majority of what we know about the earliest stone tools is associated with the old one. The oldest sites that we have associated with the old one occur at a series of sites called Katagona in the middle Awash, Ethiopia. While passive hammer and bipolar percussion are no doubt used in the old one, at least to some extent, Mostly what we see are freehand percussion flaking methods. This is something I'm much more comfortable with and much more familiar with. Basically what I do is I manipulate the core around, try to find about a 70 degree angle, strike it with a hard hammer, and remove flakes. We'll talk much more about this as this series continues, especially in our next video in this series all about stone tool survival. So what we find associated with these early sites is pretty darn impressive. We see that very early on, they're not just going around taking whichever rocks are present. Instead, it's as though they've tested enough of these rocks to know which ones are gonna respond well to producing flakes, which ones will make a good hammer stone, and then these are what they transport back to their sites. So the rocks and the frequency of those types of stones are different in the sites than they are directly adjacent in the river channel. And that shows material selection strategies. It shows linear thought patterning. It shows that our ancestors, even at this early, early age, were already reading patterns on the landscape and they could understand the material properties of the lithic raw material, the stone. Additionally, the way that our ancestors struck flakes from these cores would sometimes lead to napping accidents. About a 90 degree angle is what you don't want in one of these cores. It makes it very difficult to detach a flake but they learned how to manipulate and turn these cores so that they could continue to remove blanks in different directions. In other words, it shows that they have a plan in mind, they know how to manipulate the core, and they're solving problems along the way. Changing climate made it a little bit more difficult to access food resources, and so our ancestors began manufacturing stone tools, and we believe in part to access meat. One of the reasons that meat provides so much nutrition is it is perfect protein and fat in any landscape with a lot of predators. Those predator animals will attack others, let's say ungulates, hoofed animals. When they attack them, they'll take them down and they'll eat their fill. And then what they often do, and this is the same for mountain lions here in California or true lions in the great continent of Africa, they'll eat their fill and they'll pass out. It's like a food coma. And when they do that, other animals like scavengers, hyenas for instance, will come in and steal parts of the carcass away. What we believe our ancestors were doing at this point was running in and stealing away portions of those carcasses. Now, Australopithecus is not particularly large and they're contending with other scavengers that are fighting for these scraps. So by having a sharp cutting edge, they can run in, disarticulate a joint and run off with that one portion of an animal take that to higher ground or even up a tree, and then using the core as a chopper, they can percuss open the bones, 
remove the fat and protein rich marrow, use the flakes to cut portions of the meat that might still be adhering to those bones and get little snacks off of that as well. It's a way of securing high energy food even in a relatively unpredictable environment. And we believe it was the backbone, the foundation for building the most costly organ in the human body, the human brain. That'll do the trick. Okay, so we have some solid cores. We have some solid, very, very sharp flakes. This is our Oldowan toolkit. I'm gonna use this today, but I'm gonna use this ancient technology as if I were a modern human, which I am. Now, Homo habilis and Australopithecus, they were not cooking, so they would have been doing this as marrow sashimi, but uh, that's not my style. I'm a modern human, I'm gonna cook my marrow. I'm gonna do it right here on an open fire, right next to the ocean. Could not be simpler. But look at the edge on this. And that right there would be all I need to access the marrow cavity. Mmm, yum, charred black, just like mama used to make. <laughs> so I've got my fire over here. I'm roasting up that bone. I'm gonna crack it open and extract the marrow. I've got my hammer and anvil over here as well. And I'm using that to crack open and extract the meat from different species of wild nut. What's really interesting is that hammer and anvil technology is something that goes way, way back. And it's also something that is shared by some of our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees. So not all chimps do this, but there are certain groups or troops of chimps that have a system of shared and learned behavior, what we refer to in anthropology as culture. And mamas teach their young how to use hammers and anvils to crack open and eat nuts. So if chimps are doing it, and if our ancestors are using hammers and anvils to extract pieces of stone to make them sharp and cut and access meat, it goes without saying that it's at least possible that Australopiths and Homo habilis would have been cracking open and eating nuts using hammer and anvil technology as well. So here I've got an assortment of nuts from California. These are obviously not nuts that would be found in the wilds in Africa. But these are wild nuts from around here. We have an introduced species. This is a wild pecan. This is the nut of the gray pine. And then this is black walnut. On an anvil, give it a wrap, open it up, and there you go. Gray pine nut, same thing. This one is pretty small. That's all right, that's still edible. And black walnut. go. Black walnut's a tough one because it only comes out in little fragments, but it is so darn tasty. It's part of the nut meat there. Very, very little foraging in this video, but I had to start somewhere. A bone looks like it's pretty cooked. <laughs> Most of it's pretty charred. I think the inside should be good. You can really see the fat bubbling up right there in the middle. I think that means that marrow is definitely cooking. I sincerely hope you can see that marrow in the center just bubbling and oozing. That is pure fat and protein right there. So pretty clearly you can see all these fragments of bone here. I've cracked it open. It's off the fire, but it's got so much residual heat in there, it's still bubbling and oozing and cooking like a little oven inside that bone, which is totally cool. Wild nuts, nice little fire, and that beautiful marrow is finally cooling off. Um, yeah, first things first, any kind of nuts like these, real easy to process with hammer and handle technology. 
Got all of this fat inside here. It's in both of the ends here as well. I know, lots of charcoal on here, but look at that. It's funny to me that we've been talking about the importance of marrow and human evolution for years and years. I've been studying this and teaching about this for over 15 years. This is the first time I've ever roasted a bone on the open fire and eaten the marrow out of it. There's way too many calories in that one bone for me to handle right now, so I'm going to eat a little bit more. And then next time I do this, I think I'm going to pair that with a pasta or over crostini or something, because as an ingredient, it's rich fatty and wonderful look at how much fat has dripped out onto this cold rock it's now solidifying like butter and pooling up down below there is so much energy in this one bone so the big old piece of fatty tissue cartilage here nice cutting edge there off it comes So it's this process by using those sharp cutting edges that could potentially leave behind cut marks on the bone. The idea here is I want to cut away the tissue without actually contacting the bone so I don't dull my stone tool. But if I'm trying to get every little bite off of this, I may end up contacting the bone a little bit. And those cut marks are one of the things we see in the archaeological record. down to the beach and you're roasting up a giant cow bone and you're eating marrow and you're eating chunks of cartilage off the side of it, butchering it with stone tools and all the people are looking at you. That's what's happening right now. <laughs> Alrighty folks, let me wash my hands. I'm going to finish this one off. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode. I hope you learned some things. I know it's a little different than what I normally do. This is uh, kind of how I wanted it all to start because it's pretty similar to how it all started. Picking up every little piece off here, don't want anybody stepping on it. Now that we have some really nice, refined and predictable flakes and cores that we're just gonna drop on the ground. Now the story of how we became human is a very long one. That's not a great way to start either. <laughs> it's true though. <laughs>